Hi, welcome to today's webinar on compressed air. My name is Steve Kosky. All of PGE's seminars and webinars are in part sponsored by the Energy Trust of Oregon. We work together to make sure the concepts and recommendations you learn in our events are consistent across all of our individual programs and services. Now before we get going, let's take a chance to mark up what your systems are like. Uh, so if you select the marker button in the upper left, uh, give us a hint as to what your operating compressor horsepower is and what types of compressors you are using. I see a small system. Everyone's going to use red, huh? I'm going to have to change to a different color. I'll go to purple. A couple of oil-free systems. And uh, quite, a, quite the range in size, system sizes, too. So we have... We just about covered the board, except for, hmm. okay, we've covered the board. Excellent. We get to talk about everything. So here's our basic path, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions that pop into your mind as we go. As a, as a matter of fact, that will make the this hour more relevant to you. So feel free to send Beth a chat message with any questions that pop into your mind. Uh, we're going to talk about how compressed air is great and why we find it almost everywhere. Then we're going to talk about some of the drawbacks and fundamental inefficiencies of compressed air. Then we'll talk through a generic list of ways to save energy on any system. And we'll go through uh, five case studies where folks cleaned up their compressed air systems and saved energy. And at the end, we'll point you to some technical resources and sum up. Now, compressed air can do about anything. It can push, pull, carry, cool, stir, dry, and disappear. It's very easy to work with. It's simple to connect. It won't shock you. You don't need electricians to work with it. Uh, it works in wet and corrosive locations. Uh, compressed air actuators are inexpensive, light, and small. And spills are self-cleaning. In fact, compressed air is so wonderful that 10% of all the electricity generated in the United States goes to an air compressor somewhere. And seven of in 10 industrial sites have compressed air. That 10% is a kind of amazingly large fraction. Okay, so compressed air is versatile and it's simple and it's everywhere, so what's the problem? Uh, the problem is that air is very compressible which means that when we compress it, a lot of the energy turns into heat. So let's do a little thought experiment together. Uh, hold your hands in front of your chest and grab about a gallon of air. And now imagine squishing this gallon of air down to the size of a pint. So that's an eight to one compression ratio and would give you about 100 PSI compressed air. Now, if you could do this without letting any heat escape, what temperature would your pint of air be? So let's go ahead and everyone take a guess. Now, if you listen to the small industrial webinar, you might want to hold off on answering this. Um, so you can use your text tool. Ah, oh, see, they look at that. Use your text tool, click out on the screen, type in your answer, then click somewhere else, and that will make your answer appear to the rest of us. Just guess what, how hot do you think that pint of air would be? We didn't let any heat out. And let's use degrees Fahrenheit. 300, 350, 100, 100 degrees. Those are pretty good guesses. We 500, well, somebody nailed it. That's exactly right. Our pint of air would be 500 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, why aren't our 
pipes and tanks and hoses, all of our compressed air equipment, why isn't that all 500 degrees? It's because we've thrown away this heat of compression in oil coolers, intercoolers, and after coolers. 85% of the compressor power gets turned into heat. That means that a 100 horsepower compressor makes 85 horsepower of heat and 15 horsepower of usable air power. And that's kind of a best case situation. It could actually be a lot less than that. It might only be five horsepower or three horsepower of usable air power. So another way you can think of it, of an air compressor, is a fancy heater that makes some compressed air as a byproduct. To get 15 horsepower of air power down to the shop floor for a year, we could use $50,000 in air compressor power. Or if we could do this with a 15 horse electric motor, it would only cost us about $7,500. So what's the lesson here? Uh, compressed air is very expensive. We want to use it carefully and we want to make it efficiently. Now let's talk through some fairly generic energy saving concepts. These could apply to any energy using system, whether it's lighting or irrigation or refrigeration. Uh, number one, minimize loads. So essentially, what can we do to reduce the demand on our system? Uh, if it was an irrigation system, what can we do to reduce the amount of, of water that we have to pump? If there's refrigeration, how can we reduce the heat load into our system? Uh, use your best part load option. So most efficient, most equipment is uh, pretty efficient when it's operated at full capacity, but it's efficient, its efficiency can drop off badly when we only need 50% capacity or 10% capacity. And many times there are alternate ways to control a piece of equipment so that its efficiency remains good even though it's operating at low capacity. Uh, number three, turn it off if let's get idle equipment shut down. Number four, minimize pressure drops. Sometimes there's a bad actor that's going to have a high pressure drop across it that forces us to operate our compressors at higher pressure in order to compensate. So this could be a piece of undersized piping, uh, an undersized filter or a plug filter or something like that a partially clo a half closed valve. Uh, number five, optimize pressure settings. So we need enough pressure to do the job, but excess pressure just raises our compressor power and kind of raises the flow that goes to leaks and unregulated users. Keep idling time to a minimum. Now this is kind of related to number three, turn it off. Oftentimes we can't immediately shut off a compressor but we can use the automatic controls to let the compressor uh, time out and shut down automatically and then turn, turn itself back on automatically when, when it's needed again. Right technology. So from time to time we see someone using the wrong technology for the job and this can cause the system to be just fundamentally inefficient and use more power than is necessary. So one example would be using a desiccant dryer to provide very dry air to a system when the when super dry air just isn't needed, or maybe using some inexpensive cheap tubing fittings that develop leaks quickly instead of using some a better type of fitting. Uh, right size equipment. Now, we want the right size equipment. Undersized equipment using, usually isn't a problem because if a plant has chronically low plant air pressure, well, they're going to buy more air compressors. But sometimes we see oversized systems, and an oversized system that's operating at very low capacity uh, can be very inefficient and could be an opportunity to save some energy. Uh, number nine, remove barriers to more efficient set points. That's uh, self-explanatory. And 10, make the most of your controls. Many systems already have efficient controls in place that just aren't being used. Um, and can just be activated. And if not, a controls upgrade is often the best use of 
the best bang for your buck for an energy upgrade, it can often be a lot cheaper than an, a wholesale equipment replacement. So now let's look at a handful of case studies that range from uh, small to large systems. Uh, the first system we have here is a shop air system. These guys are operating a 75 horse oil flooded screw compressor that's rated at 330 CFM. This, com this compressor is only averaging about 31% capacity. And they do have it in automatic mode, but the compressor won't unload, so it's just using inlet modulation only. They have a heated desiccant dryer that's rated for 550 CFM, and this dryer has no purge controls. So whenever we see something like that, it sure looks like somebody got some used equipment on a fire sale. When equipment's oversized or mismatched like this, you know, the initial purchase price can be really cheap, but the purchase price of equipment ends up being less than like 10% of the cost of ownership over the life of the equipment. So the bargain on the purchase price can often be a very, very expensive mistake. Now let's talk about inlet modulation control for a minute. It adjusts the inlet valve to the compressor to control how much air the compressor is making. It's very low cost and it can produce a fairly steady discharge pressure, but it has fairly lousy part load performance. So at full load, you can see we're gonna use 100% power when we're at 100% capacity. So for a base loaded compressor, this is just fine. But for a compressor, you know, that's gonna be in mid or low capacity, you know, when this compressor is not making any air, it's going to still use like 70% power. And at 50% capacity, it's still using something like 85% power. So not very good at, at medium and low capacity. Now on the right half of our screen, we have a few examples of desiccant dryer purge saving controls that have all uh, unfortunately been bypassed. So many desiccant dryers have energy save, come with energy saving controls. Some don't, but you see them on a good number of dryers. Now these all have some sort of a dew point sensor or a moisture sensor that will eventually fail and need to be repaired or replaced or cleaned off or something. And the first thing you do when that sensor dies is you, you shut off the automatic purge saving mode like these guys did. And that puts the dryer back into a just continuously regenerating mode. Just fixed cycle regenerates continuously no matter how much air is going through it. So then what should happen is you buy a new sensor, you get the sensor serviced, you put it back in and you put the, activate the energy saving controls and you're off to the races. But many times this doesn't happen because look, I just flipped this switch and now my problem's solved. Um, your, your immediate problem is solved, but when these purge saving, when the, when the dryer purges continuously, it uses a lot, it forces the compressor to make a lot more compressed air, which uses more compressor power. Now in this shop, the, the single biggest user was the purge for this desiccant dryer. The second biggest user were, were what we'd expect, pneumatic tools and just general shop air use. They had also a handful of timer drains, which totaled about 10% of their air use. And surprisingly, they had almost no leaks. Most systems are, have leak flows of you know 20 to 35%, but these guys had a very tight system. And $22,000 a year, to operate this system in electricity. What they decided to do was to go with uh, two 15 horsepower screw compressors that uses they used a load unload control. They put in a very large tank, uh, certainly larger than they needed to. They upgraded the timer drains to no air loss drains, and they 
went with a refrigerated dryer that doesn't use any purge air. So that was a big load reduction there for them. And this was not a cheap project, about $55,000 to do all this. And it brought their electrical costs from $22,000 a year to $7,000 a year. So that's a pretty big savings. So that's a three and a half year payback, you know, before any utility incentives. Now, these guys could have, they didn't have to spend all this money. They could have kind of cleaned up the operation of the ex existing equipment. They could have used load on load control on their existing compressor and added some purge saving controls to the dryer. But the equipment was so badly sized, so oversized, they just decided to start over. Uh, why such a big tank? Why such a monster tank? Well, the owner wanted there to be enough time during every cycle for the compressors to actually shut down. So they put in a, a larger tank than they probably needed to. Let's see. One interesting thing here is they did install, they chose to install two compressors instead of one. They probably could have installed one uh, 25 or 30 horse compressor, but by having two compressors, well, first of all, one operates alone like 90% of the time. The second compressor very rarely operates. And that also bought them some redundancy. So if one compressor was down, for maintenance, then the shop probably wouldn't even notice it. They'd, they could operate just fine most of the time. Steve, why did they install screw compressors and not a reciprocating compressor? Uh, yeah, they probably could have installed reciprocating compressors here also, and that would have brought the project cost down. Uh, the screw compressors, the small screw compressors continue to be more and more available and the price gets better and better. So maybe the price difference, difference wasn't so much. And screw compressors are, have longer lives and lower maintenance costs. So that's, my guess is that was kind of a maintenance driven decision to go with the screws. Now let's talk about dryers for a second. Uh, a refrigerated dryer has a small refrigeration system in it, just like a fridge or an air conditioner. And it cools the incoming air with the refrigeration system, and then it strips out the condensed water. And then they have a little heat exchanger that heats up the outgoing air before it goes out to the filters and dryers. And refrigerated dryers are great when the air users are indoors and when ultra pure air isn't needed, as it might be for like high-tech or pharmaceutical uses. And refrigerated dryers can produce air that has a dew point of about 35 to 40 degrees. So if our pipes are above 35, 40, you know, our pipes are indoors above 40 degrees, then we shouldn't have any condensation with, and we can use a refrigerated dryer. But if you need drier air, the next step up is to a desiccant dryer, which produce air that has about a minus 40 degree dew point. And there are several kinds of desiccant dryers, but they're all much more expensive to buy and more expensive to operate than refrigerated dryers. So in general, refrigerated dryers are our friends and we wanna use them whenever possible. So another kind of side issue is what if like 99% of your users are inside the building, but you do have some a bag house or some valve some control valves outside the building for a, for a small amount of your air use. Well, you could use a master refrigerated dryer and then put a small desiccant dryer, you could bolt that to the wall and let that serve just your, your bag house or something like that to eliminate you know, freezing risks during the winter. Okay, so, the shop that upgraded from the 75 horse compressor to the two smaller compressors. Let's mark this up. Let's mark up the concepts that they used to capture energy savings. And you can just use your marker and make a dot or scribble a line on the concepts you think they used.
Yeah, eight. That's the first one that came to my mind, the right size equipment. That 75 horse compressor was too big. The dryer was was mismatched, so it wasn't the right size either. And then right technology, they didn't need the desiccant dryer, so they're kind of using the wrong technology. Uh, yeah, minimizing loads, getting rid of that purge load from the dryer. Yep. Uh, turning it off. Yeah, very good. Keep idling time to a minimum. Yeah, also that one, because they put in that very large tank so that the compressors could actually shut down. All right. Now let's talk about a compressed air system that's serving a palletizer. So this is grabbing cases of product off a conveyor belt and stacking them on pallets. And it's served by a 30-horse oil-flooded screw compressor. Now, we haven't really talked about oil-flooded versus oil-free screws, so let's touch on that briefly. So there's two basic types of screw compressors, oil-flooded and oil-free. Oil-flooded screws inject some oil into the rotors, and the oil absorbs a lot of heat. It absorbs that heat of compression. And the oil also helps seal up the gaps between the rotors and the housing. And after the compressed air, after the air is compressed, it goes into a sump or an oil separator where there's a coalescing element that strips out the oil. And the oil is recirculated through the machine, and the air goes off through the after cooler and out to the filter and dryer. Oil-free compressors are similar, but they don't inject any oil. So they don't have a sump or an oil separator. And the other big difference is that there's two sets of screws. There's two stages of compression. The first pair of screws will compress the air up to about 25 or 30 pounds PSI. And then the second, then after that, the air is also at about 300 degrees, so it's quite hot, and there will be an intercooler. Then the air will go into the second stage of compression, where it's compressed up to the final discharge pressure. 100 PSI or whatever you're using. And so there's no oil that it's ever in contact with the airstream, so there's inherently less risk of getting contaminants into the air supply. But the big, so that's, that's kind of cool, but the downside is cost. Oil-free compressors cost basically twice as much as an oil-flooded compressor. Now, Steve? this palletizing, yeah. Steve, sorry. Before you go on, I had a question from a participant. Um, can minus 40 degree Fahrenheit dew point air freeze outside? Uh, not unless the temperature is below minus 40. So, yeah, your, your pressure dew point is kind of where you're going to start to see condensation in your pipe. So if, you're, if your dryer is working well and you have minus 40 degree dew point air in your pipes, you know, you could be minus 20 outside and there will be no condensation inside your pipes. There, yeah, you'd have to be in a pretty cold environment to get your pipes down to minus 40. Now, that being said, not all dryers are functioning properly, and we see people with desiccant dryers actually have liquid water even inside their plant because uh, there's something, the desiccant is old and has failed, or there's a valve that's failed on the dryer that's not closing or opening properly. I mean, there's there's many ways desiccant dryers can cannot be doing their job, and then you could still have freezing problems in that case. The other thing you can't do with a desiccant dryer is you can't send it liquid water. So the moisture traps, the moisture removal devices on the compressor uh, in the after cooler. So your air goes into the after cooler that's, that knocks a ton of moisture out of it. And then right after the after cooler, there's a moisture separator. And if that's not functioning properly and it's sending liquid water downstream to a dryer, well, the dryer can't handle that much water and you won't get your minus 40 degree dew point out of your dryer. Uh, maybe you have a tank. This is one way a tank can kind of serve as a backup device. If the air goes out of that compressor and goes into a tank, um, there will be a drain on the tank. And so hopefully that, that would be a second chance to drain that liquid water out before it goes into a dryer. 
Now these guys Thanks, were running, Steve. oh, no problem. So their, their air pressure was 125 to 130 pounds. I think we saw that up here. And they also had been running this compressor in uh, the hand mode here, and nobody knew why. That's just, it had been running in hand since day one. That's how they always operated it. We also, when we showed up on site, we noticed that the, the desiccant dryer wasn't purging. It, somebody had accidentally shut off the purge air to that dryer for at least three weeks, but they hadn't really noticed any problems, so I kind of got lucky there. Uh, the users are, it's just this palletizing equipment. It's in a refrigerated area. It's in an area that's 35 or 40 degrees, so, you know, you, prob you probably couldn't get away with a, it'd be questionable if you could get away with a refrigerated dryer at that temperature. Uh, the other users is the dryer purge. Uh, dryers typically purge about 14% of their rated flow and leaks. And so this system cost uh, almost $12,000 a year to operate. And what they decided to go after was some no-cost upgrades. They basically, they put the compressor in automatic mode and they hung a big sign on it to make sure everybody knew, don't run it in hand, run this in auto. And that allowed it to operate in load unload mode and they reduced the load and unload settings to kind of match the needs of the users. They only really needed 90 pounds to keep the palletizing equipment running. And they had the technician do this on his next regularly scheduled trip out there and so it was essentially no cost to do this and it saved them $3,300 a year. So instant payback project. So they moved into this load unload control mode and when a screw compressor unloads, the inlet valve closes or nearly closes and the sump blowdown valve opens to relieve the pressure in the sump. And that sump pressure determines compressor power. So if the sump blows down to atmospheric pressure, it's gonna have very low unloaded power. It might be 18 or 20% power when it's fully unloaded. But if the, if the compressor is holding, you know, 25 to 50 pounds in the sump, it might have, you know, higher unloaded power. And I, we've seen compressors have as high as 50% power when completely unloaded if, if that sump pressure is high. And so this case one, this load unload case one, you can see this is pretty good part load performance relative to inlet modulation. There's a, there's a fair amount of space between those two lines. The case two is kind of a load unload scenario, but not done as well. Uh, the compressor, you know, has a high sump pressure when it's unloaded. Or the other thing that can hurt load unload is if you have a, a low tank, insufficient tank volume, and the compressors rapidly cycle load unload, load unload super quickly, you'll get poor performance out of it. Okay, so the palletizer with this 30 horse oil flooded compressor, what do these guys do to save energy? Go ahead and mark that up with your, with your marking pen. Yeah, optimized pressure settings for sure. They didn't need 125, 130 pounds. And yes, use your best part load option. These would be my, my first two choices also. They already had the ability to use, oh yeah, and that, that also feeds into number 10, make the most of your controls. So they had these controls, they just didn't know about them. And uh, activate them, adjust them, and they're off to the races for no money. This next case study is a textile processor. They're operating uh, a 225 horsepower variable speed oil flooded compressor and it runs 40 to 100% load. They have a couple older compressors there, but they almost never operate. And their discharge pressure is uh, 110 pounds off the compressor. They have, they have a nice cycling refrigerated dryer and they have a flow controller that's holding uh, 90 pounds downstream pressure. 
and a lot of tank volume. The users on this system is textile processing equipment. It's not particularly pressure sensitive. 85, 95 pounds is just fine. They, but the big issue was the leak load. You, during production periods, you couldn't hear it, but when the production floor would clear out during breaks, you, the whole place just hissed. And there were leaks throughout the floor. They were easy to find just by using your ear. And they had, this whole place had been installed just using what we call just a barbed hose fitting where you just shove the tubing onto this and you're done. And this system cost $86,000 a year to operate. Now their variable speed compressor here already has really nice part load performance. So they don't have anything that they really need to change there. They just need to get their air demand down. They're the power of this compressor is going to follow the airflow pretty well. So as you suspect, what they did is they went after these leaks and they changed these uh, problem. Well, they were able to just fix a ton of leaks and they found some areas that were particularly troublesome that had just, you know, one out of two tubing connections were leaking and they actually changed those to a double ferrule type fitting to ensure that they would not, you know, leak, be leaking as badly as they were in another year. They also did a test where they, instead of having the compressor discharge at 110 pounds, they bypassed the flow controller and adjusted the compressor to discharge at 94 pounds. And that gave them the same, the same pressure out to the users. And between those two things, the the leak repair and bypassing that flow controller, that saved them uh, $22,000 a year. Now flow controllers can be good when applied correctly, but they don't save energy in all cases. In this case, it was causing them to run about 16 PSI higher discharge pressure with, with no real noticeable benefit. So the textile processor, let's mark up what they did to save energy. What do you think? Yeah, so I can see right technology as far as using those double ferrule fittings in those problem area problem areas. Yeah, remove the barriers and optimize pressure settings. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, and then there you go. Probably number one is minimize the loads, get that leak flow down. So that compressor doesn't have to run 40 to 100, maybe it can run 20 to 80% capacity. Excellent. Okay, a beverage bottling plant here. Now, these get, we're not going to get into the supply side, but it's a large system, very efficient, very good controls, which means that if we can reduce air demand, we're going to reduce compressor power. And here's a partial list of some of their users. So they had five of these air-powered vibrators that were averaging 50 CFM. They had a vacuum generation on packaging and palletizing equipment that was averaging 284 CFM. They had a bunch of uh, Vortex cabinet, well, not a bunch, they had nine Vortex cabinet coolers that were consuming about 117 CFM. And they had leaks. They knew they had a lot of, lots of internal leaks inside packaging lines. Now, Vortex cabinet coolers seem like black magic to me. You put compressed air in and you get hot air out the top and cold air out the bottom. But they can become fouled and the cold side won't get as cold as it should be. And they're usually used to cool electrical cabinets and you blow the cool air into the cabinet. And these days they usually come with a thermostat control. So when the cabinet gets to temperature, it'll, it'll stop the air consumption. But there are some older uh, Vortex cabinet coolers out there that don't have thermostats and just are in cooling constantly. So the upgrades these guys pursued were they just completely replaced the air-powered vibrators with electric units. These electric units use 10% of the power that the electric units use. 
So that saved them 50 CFM. They also looked, took a close look at the vacuum generators on the packaging and palletizing equipment. They upgraded to a, a, a more modern generator more modern type of vacuum generator that shuts off the air, not the vacuum, when the set point's achieved or when when you don't need to be, when it's idle. They also had an auto shut off feature, so when you reached uh, 20 inches of vacuum, it would automatically shut off the air. And this netted them 144 CFM of savings, so 51% savings with the new vacuum generators. They also took apart and cleaned out these Vortex cabinet coolers, and they added thermostats. So this saved them almost half of the air those guys were using. And then rather than going in and trying to repair the hundreds of tubing connections inside the packaging lines, they just said, well, that seems like that's too much for us. What we're going to do, though, is we will install some automatic isolation valves on these lines. And as soon as the line's not packaging anything, we're going to shut off the air to it. Then we're going to wire this up so that it happens automatically. So we don't have to rely on someone to close a valve. As soon as the controls go down for that line, the compressed air valve will shut. And that netted them 125 CFM of savings. So grand total, they ended up with 373 CFM of flow reduction, and they had good compressor controls, so flow reduction translates to power and dollar reduction. And so this ended up saving them $20,000, $28,000 a year, and to do that work, it cost about $31,000. So, you know, close to a one-year payback project there, fairly attractive. All right, get your markers out, and let's mark up what these guys, what concepts were in play for the beverage bottler. Yeah, number one, that's probably the biggest one. This is all about load reduction. And right technology, yeah, that's the big one. Those air-powered vibrators are quite the energy hog. And kind of a rule of thumb there is if you have an air-powered vibrator that's running more than 30, well, air-powered vibrators and pneumatic pumps, if you find those that are, if they run infrequently, then the economics probably aren't there to change them to an electric unit. But if they're running more than maybe 30% of the time, that's a signal to dig into that. Maybe you can move to uh, an electrically actuated diaphragm pump or an electric powered vibrator. Yeah, turn it off also, getting the air off to those packaging lines so we don't have to feed their leaks. When the line's just sitting there, nobody's nobody's using it. Yep, very good. Okay, auto parts manufacturer. A little different world here. These guys are running uh, centrifugal compressors, three 500-horse centrifugal compressors. So during the week, they run one compressor is typically base-loaded, and the other compressor is typically blowing off, so it's at par load. And one compressor will operate alone on the weekend, usually blowing off air. And they have some very nice dryers, these heated desiccant dryers with uh, purge controls that are active. Now, centrifugal compressors, these guys really come into their prime somewhere around 400 horsepower and above. Uh, they'll end up costing less than screw compressors. They, they have good full load performance, and they can have lower maintenance costs. And they just naturally make oil-free air. And you do see them sometimes in smaller smaller systems, but somewhere around 400 horsepower is where they really start to take control. But the, the big drawback with centrifugals is their part load performance. You can see they can turn down efficiently at the top end of their range using inlet butterfly valve or inlet guide vane control. But somewhere below, and this varies a little bit from compressor to compressor, but somewhere below 70 or 80% capacity, 
they actually can't produce any less air or the compressor will surge, which damages the compressor. So what they do is they, they make the air and then they just throw it away. So you can see the power is just constant once we get below that, that minimum turndown point. You can see an inlet guide vane gives you a little bit lower power than just using an inlet butterfly valve. And inlet guide vane is uh, a valve that kind of spins the air as it goes through it, and it unloads the compressor a little bit. So similar to a screw, compre a screw compressor, an inlet, a centrifugal compressor can also operate unloaded at low power with the inlet valve shut and the blow-off valve open. But centrifugal compressors are only rarely operated in a like a load-unload mode, like an oil-free screw or an oil-flooded screw, like they're commonly operated. They're typically only unloaded as part of study, uh, starting up the compressor or shutting down the compressor. These guys had a bunch of bag houses. They're all outside and they're consuming about 175 CFM of air and they just pulse constantly. They're just always cleaning these bags. They also had a pressure sensitive uh, distant user that was fed by a very long one inch pipe. So there was a large pressure drop out to this user which was kind of driving their whole plant uh, discharge, discharge pressure setting. They had to run about 115 pounds back in the compressor room to keep this guy happy. And their electrical costs were about $378,000 per year to operate this system. What they went after was uh, a brand new control system. So they had, to they had to replace all the compressor control panels. And then on top of that, they added a supervisory control system that could kind of reach in and grab control of the compressors and, and control them as a group. And what this supervisory controller could do is could modulate all of the compressors simultaneously and test and shut down a second compressor whenever possible. So it's whenever possible, it will keep both compressors during the week up here in the, kind of the efficient trim range. And that's more efficient, you can, you can imagine how it would be better to operate, you know, two compressors here than it would be to operate one compressor base loaded and the other compressor, you know, blowing off air. So that's pretty nice, the simultaneous modulation. Uh, and that works really well with centrifugals, it doesn't translate so well back to screw compressors. We with screw compressors, we do generally want everybody base loaded except for one trim compressor. Steve, um, if centrifugal compressors are this bad at part load, then why do you why do we use them? Yeah, well, when you need a lot of compressed air, they're more cost effective than screw compressors. Uh, you know, if you need two, three, four, five, 10,000, 20,000 horsepower worth of compressed air, a screw compressor system is gonna be, would be more expensive. Now, you can combine screws and centrifugals. Uh, you could have a very efficiently designed system with centrifugals making 80% uh, of the compressed air and screws trimming, making that last 20% very efficiently. Then we can use everybody kind of where they're they're best suited. Or if you don't want to do that, you can do what these guys did. You could have the control system to kind of do the simultaneous modulation. The other neat thing that this controller does is it can test to see if it can shut down a second compressor. And that's, the, that's really the big trick here. It's easy to modulate two compressors together, but the trick is how do you know when you could shut one of them off? Well, the controller will periodically, it will load one compressor all the way up, and then it will see if it can unload the other compressor all the way. And if it can, it'll actually unload the compressor and it'll start a timer. And if it can stay, if it can keep basically just making air with one compressor, 
with the other compressor not making any air for a period of time, it'll just shut it down. So that's pretty slick controller. They also cleaned up some of their demand side. They added some uh, controls to these bag houses to stop the bag cleaning when it wasn't needed. It basically just looks at the differential pressure across the bags. And when it hits a high set point, it starts the pulsing. And when it hits a low set point, it stops the pulsing. And this netted them 110 CFM of savings on average. Then they installed a two inch line in parallel with that existing one inch line, which kind of made that pressure sensitive user no longer kind of the plant bottleneck. And that allowed them to get their discharge pressures from 115 down to 102 pounds. And the big benefit there is that when you have a pipeline pressurized at 115 pounds versus 102 pounds, well, any leaks on that pipeline are going to leak better at the higher pressure. They're going to leak more. So getting that down saves, it actually reduces demand. Uh, this project ended up saving $74,000 a year. But you can see this was not, not a cheap project. You know, this line was, ex the piping was expensive and these controls were expensive, the control upgrade. But still, you know, within, within the realm of acceptability for many companies and uh, there was some utility participation here that made it more attractive. So let's mark this up. What did, what did these guys, what did our auto parts maker do to capture some energy savings? Yeah, big time, minimize loads. That's reducing the amount of air that that system had to make. Yeah, and two, opt, use your best part load option, definitely. Let's, let's modulate two centrifugals at the same time rather than having a base trim set up. And then getting that second compressor off and kind of turn it off also on the bag house cleaning too because, you know, they, they don't have to clean all the time. And minimize pressure drops, yep. That distant user was causing them problems and they fixed that and then they optimized the settings. So, yep, I see all those in there. Very good. Now, compressed air is a very big world with all kinds of complexity. You see new things all the time, but thankfully there are some good routes for assistance. Uh, PGE and the Energy Trust have free energy efficiency services. You can visit uh, portlandgeneral.com slash business and commercial customers can contact Paula Conway on the slide and industrial customers can contact uh, Stacy Milliman. And if you're not a PGE customer, you can contact your local utility for assistance. So what's the message? Compressed air is really cool stuff. It's really versatile, but it is fundamentally inefficient. So let's use it carefully and let's make it efficiently. And let's turn it back to Beth for some questions. Thank you, Steve. And before we proceed to the question and answer portion of the webinar, I'd like to remind you that you can continue to submit questions to me through chat and I will ask them of Steve. And it looks like our first question is, how much tank volume is needed for load unload control? Uh, with an oil flooded compressor, you, uh, the rule of thumb is five gallons of tank volume per CFM that your trim compressor makes. So if you if you have three compressors and they're all different sizes and all three of them could be the trim compressor, um, then you would pick the biggest compressor and let's say it's a 500 CFM compressor, then you'd go five gallons per CFM. So it'd be a 2,500 gallons of, of storage volume. That's, that's kind of a starting rule of thumb. Uh, if it's a oil free compressor, you can use less tank volume because there's no sump that blows down. When an oil-free compressor unloads, the power drops to 
it's fully unloaded power in like two seconds. It's very, very quick. Thanks, uh, Steve. And uh, so our next question is, um, can you refer us to a leak rate versus cost table? Yes. Uh, it depends a little bit on the, the price of power in your area. But uh, Beth, do we have the ability to email these email materials to these people? Oh, absolutely, yes, over? we'll be doing that, yeah. Okay, so we, we'll send you a link or a chart on that. Great, we'll definitely include that. And then uh, next question is, uh, can any of that heat of compression be used for HVAC systems or other heat demanding processes? Sometimes, if, so there, if you need shop, the easiest and most common use is if you just have a big shop, like I've been to places where they're making uh, truck trailers, and they just have a big shop and they have electric or gas heaters in them, and during the winter the shop just gets cold and, you know, these heaters run more and more. Well, that's a great way we can use that heat off of the air compressors if they're, you know, relatively close to the shop and just duct the discharge air off the after coolers, uh, just duct that right into the building. And you could, you'd, and they don't want that heat, you know, come springtime, they'll be like, shut that heat off. So you typically have a damper that you can swing to send that heat, you know, out the side of the building or out the roof in the summer. But that's one great way to use heat. Um, if you need the heat a long way away, it can be, it can be, prohibitive to move that that warm air a long distance. Um, another way that you see sometimes is people will use it to preheat water, like wash water or maybe boiler feed water. They'll have the air that's coming from the city or from the well at 55 degrees or something. And if they have a water-cooled compressor, then they might be able to get a stream of, you know, 120 or 130 degree water out of the compressor, and that just reduces, you know, the amount of natural gas they have to burn to make to heat up their boiler feed water or their wash water. Yeah, there there are a few ways to use it. They sometimes the economics don't work out, but sometimes they do. If you you know, if you fit in the right situation. We just got a comment from one of our participants saying we dump our heat of compression to our chill water system. How wasteful is that? Yeah. So. Uh, people that are cooling, air compressors are all designed to be able to use cooling tower water, which is, you know, nominally maybe 85 degrees in the summer, a cooling tower can make 85 degree water and use very little power because it's just using the evaporation. It's, it's not using any mechanical refrigeration system. So that's what your compressor can operate on. It can also operate on chilled water if you want to run a chiller and send it, you know, 40 degree water or something like that. They'll do. They'll be just fine on that also. But then you're putting all that heat through the chiller, and so you just kind of bought yourself a big heat load for your chilled water plant. Um, oftentimes you can get away from that, you can buy a small cooling tower, you know, and just put it up above the compressor room on the roof and serve your compressors with that tower water and get rid of that load off the chiller. That would be a good energy project. Hmm. Well, I think we have time for one more question, and that is um, I'm about to buy an oil-free screw compressor with VFD. Is that a good idea? Yeah, so oil-free screw compressors have low power when they're unloaded, and they also unload very quickly. So the load-unload control is is pretty efficient. Um, now at, at lower loads, uh, a VFD, say below 50% capacity, a VFD will save some energy relative to load-unload control, but it's usually not a drastic amount. So, and, and if you're operating the compressor, you know, if the compressor is going to be at mid and upper range, mid and upper capacity, there there might not be very much energy savings at all. Um, so, yeah, there's not a huge difference in performance there. 
Okay. Thank you. Well, that was our last question. Thank you, Steve, and thank you all for joining us.